Welcome back to Naval Gazing at Camp David. As you see in the background, Sylvia had me busy this weekend prepping for Christmas. Hope you enjoy the decorations. This week's yacht is the most popular size format from Robertson and Kane, and now is the new home for the Barefoot Doctors on YouTube, the Leopard 45. Today, we are going to review its specification, pricing and layout against three similar vessels, do a full tour asking what would Sylvia say, navel gaze at an innovation and or adjustment that might make life aboard easier, have a look at the used market for three to five year old comparables, and finally, give it a Dave score and compare it to all the other yachts we've looked at so far. All this fun will be sandwiched between a wine pairing from the same region as the guest yacht and a look at a favorite sample of art from the same region. Yachts, waves, ideas, wine and art. What a civilized way to spend 30 minutes. So let's get going. Starting high above Vancouver, Canada, we fly across the Atlantic to the old submarine base in Lorraine. France and the home of last week's yacht, the ORC-42. From there, we head south down the European continent, across the Med and all the way down to the African continent to the home of Robertson and Kane in Cape Town, South Africa, and this week's guest yacht, the Leopard 45. From Cape Town, we head inland to the vineyards of Nate Valley and this week's wine pairing, Nate Valley Saison 2019. Nate Valley Saison 2019 is the father to their national varietal Pinotage and once stalwart red varietal of the industry. Saison has since fallen into obscurity. Affectionately still called Hermitage by the many old timers, it creates superbly drinkable wines festooned with red fruit, spice and surprising structure to age gracefully. This tribute to their wine-making past was hate that have resolutely withstood time and showcases the varietal's essence. The historical Nate Valley Farm, situated at the foot of Smusberg, is a new cellar. It's just been resettled for the last 50... Uh, the historical Nate Valley Farm, situated at the foot of Smusberg, is a new cellar. It's just been resting for the last 50 years. Famed for its brandy in years gone by, it was one of the largest sellers in the area, but sadly winemaking ceased in the 50s. It was bought by the Milner family in the late 60s, and for 27 years, it bred some of South Africa's finest racehorses. It was in 2005 that the wine was once again made on the farm and the sound of barrels rolling could be heard. Grapes are picked by hand, bottled by hand, corked by hand, and labeled by hand. Oh, that's good. Cheers, let's go have a look at that boat. Looking at the Leopard 45, you know, she's a handsome boat. Good lines, a little shorter, you know, the lines uh, do better for longer yachts as most do, but this is a good looking vessel. Uh, you can see that beautiful fly lounge on the top, fantastic cockpit in behind, the uh, sort of a, a mid-tier um, helm position, which is really nice. Um, the uh, front cockpit, of course, which is outstanding. It's got that drawback a shade as well. I mean, all in all, just a terrific looking vessel and obviously built for the waters that it is uh, envisioned in. Looking now at the numbers, we're looking at the Elba 45, the Lagoon 46, the Leopard 45, and the Neil 43 as our comparables today. If we have a look at the profiles here, you can see that the uh, Leopard 45 most closely resembles the Elba 45. Uh, the sail area, however, you've got um, the Lagoon 46 at 169.5 square meters for upwind sail area, which is uh, you know, the largest of the bunch. The next is the Elba 45 at 124, but very closely followed by the Leopard 45 at 121.5. The Neil 43 at 1018 is, is the lowest. As we head on to the cabin top, 
you can immediately see that elegant Sky Lounge on the Leopard 45, uh, very similar uh, to the Elba 45, but honestly, between the two of them, I do prefer the Leopard. It's got the table. It's, it's just a, a nicer general feel to it. I also like that mid-helm. Uh, both of them have mid-helms, uh, but I do like the Leopard 45. It feels incredibly professional and finished with that hard top. Heading into the saloon. You can see uh, the size, the square footage on the Elba 45 is quite dramatic. Uh, the Leopard is pretty darn close and probably the equivalent in depth, uh, but the Elba just seems to look a little broader. Now, having said that, um, I, I do generally prefer the layout of the Leopard 45. And remember, it also has to give room for the uh, forward access into the front cockpit. So you have through saloon access to the bow of the boat, which I really like, as you all know. Uh, the uh, Lagoon 46 has good space, <clears throat> absolutely, as does the Neil 43. But again, the Neil 43 does sacrifice some of that main, uh, main saloon space uh, for the owner's uh, berth. Moving now into the hulls and the cabins, uh, the Le Leopard 45, um, Again, has a full uh, hull master. Uh, actually, all three of the big brands do. And of course, the Neil is different in that it has the owner's cabin on the main floor and smaller cabins uh, in the hulls and uh, the Amas and the center hull. Uh, the width of the Leopard 45 hulls is noticeably a little narrower than the other two big brands. Of course, the Neil 43 has those pin needle uh, armors and a, a, like a, a central hull that's about the same width as the uh, FP45 uh, uh, side hulls. Uh, overall, uh, the layout of the Leopard 45 is very nice, but you will see as we get into it, although it's a, a really nice layout, great head and shower area, the angles are a little harsh, and I don't know how else to put that. It's just a little angular, and I'd appreciate it if it was uh, softened a bit. Heading to the numbers themselves, if we look along the uh, top line in euros, you can see the Fountain Peugeot at 624, the Lagoon at 623, and the Leopard at 723. Um, it, it, it does seem a little more expensive, but again, these prices are so variable. This is the base price, this is FOB factory, uh, but the, the changes in exchange rate, the changes in uh, materials for these vessels and the, the whole supply chain and logistics really throw a month-by-month -month inaccuracy into any pricing. So take this with a grain of salt, although I do believe the Leopard is a tad more expensive for what you're getting. The Neil 43, of course, at about a hundred, uh, uh, two, three hundred less, but it is quite a small vessel as you see when you get on board. So, moving on to the actual length overall, it's the Lagoon that leads the pack at 45.9. Uh, then you've got the Leopard at 45 and the Fountain Peugeot at 44.1. Uh, the Draft, the Fountain Peugeot uh, leads the pack at 1.2 meters uh, with the Leopard at 1.5 meters. Upwind sail area, the Lagoon has it at 169.5. And then moving into the uh, displacement, the uh, Neil, of course, has it at nine ton. Uh, among the other three, which are really comparable, you've got the Elba 45 at 14 ton, the Lagoon at a staggering 15.7, 15.8 ton, and the Leopard at 14.9 ton. On to engines, uh, you've got the Lagoon at 57, uh, the Elba at 450 and the uh, Leopard at 45. As far as tankage goes, uh, the Lagoon leads the uh, fuel capacity at 100 and, or 1,040 liters, uh, but the Leopard leads the water capacity at 780 liters. As far as hull construction goes, uh, from what I can see in the data, <clears throat> the Neil 43 leads the pack at polyester and vinyl ester resin infusion molding on a closed cell pet foam with quadraxial fiberglass skin reinforced with carbon fiber. 
There's um, balsa in the lagoon and the leopard, no balsa in the fountain Peugeot. So the fountain Peugeot, probably the next one, a vacuum infusion foam core, a mixture of polyester and vinyl ester over glass with a final coat of epoxy primer for blister resistance. Moving then <clears throat> to the actual performance numbers, uh, here's a bit of a surprise. So the Lagoon leads the sail area to displacement at 27.38. It even leads the Neil 43. So the 43 and the Fountain Peugeot are very similar at 23.93 and 23.17 respectively. And the Leopard, actually not terribly surprising, is at 20.25. As far as heaviness goes, um, the Neil 43 leads the pack with a displacement to hull length of 111.4. Uh, the next one there is going to be the Fountain Peugeot at 151.86 <clears throat> with again the uh, Leopard uh, dragging behind at 185.74. Bruce number, the uh, Lagoon leads the pack at 1.31. If you're enjoying the content thus far, please subscribe, hit a like and share this with a couple of like-minded sailors. Also, gentlemen, Please share this with your wives and have them comment on live aboard life for Sylvia so she knows there's social engagement, she knows it's safe, she knows she can get her hair done now and then, that sort of thing. Lady sailors, please do the same. I would really appreciate it. Thanks. Let's get going on board. Hopping on board, what would Sylvia say? Scanning across the cockpit, that beautiful solid teak table really makes an impression. You've got uh, the cantilever that lifts up your uh, tender nice and high and that beautiful flexi teak all over. The, uh, the uh, cabin top, uh, the underside of the cabin top, you've got those recessed sunshades, which I really like and great finish uh, with insert, uh, inset uh, pot lights and some um, uh, uh, different colors laid in there. The upholstery uh, is meant to be left out and not you know, in, out, in, out, looks terrific. You see actually the indirect lighting also in there. I mean, the whole thing really has a beautiful theme. And that inset of black there follows all the way through the central uh, saloon and out into the forward cockpit. So it really makes an impression. Look at the fairing on all of this and how nicely done it is. Um, the big, big window and sliding door access. It really is an incredibly comfortable space, refined. It feels polished and finished. Look at the inlays even in that teak table. I'd put a, a high gloss on there, but that's just me. As we head up to the helm position, uh, again, you've got great line stowage. There's no spaghetti all over the place. All the lines lead back to the helm. All your clutches are easy access. You've got your throttles there. Uh, everything feels safe and comfortable. And this hard top they've got with clear view through that window, it feels so solid. It just really feels finished. Great access and, and uh, communication to the fly lounge as well as down into the cockpit and uh, terrific visibility out over the bow to the forward uh, hulls, uh, the, the bows, as well as back to the, uh, the aft sections of the hulls. Moving up the side um, here, you've got great handholds for safety. Um, you've got uh, solar panels out on the bow and uh, a really nice uh, single spreader mast and uh, lazy, lazy bag there. Uh, safety lines, or as I like to call them, death lines. I really don't like them. They, they, to me, it's a false sense of security and would just help you in your, the style of your flip as you go over. There's your uh, solar panels, nicely uh, set in there, and terrific space out on uh, the bow area. Princess seats, um, you've got the trampolines uh, and uh, an aluminum lingerie on there. Uh, great access into the forward um, uh, sail area and uh, the the forward stowage area and of course here you are look at this forward cockpit I just don't understand why every single manufacturer 
isn't doing this right now. It is just a tremendous idea, especially if you're doing cruising in the med with med mooring. Uh, you're typically, uh, if even on the hook, you're, you're faced into the wind, so the back cockpit gets stuffy, the front cockpit takes the breeze, and of course you've got that door that opens up so that breeze flows all the way through. Look at this retractable shade here, which if it's raining as it was on this day, you pull it forward, you've got complete protection, you can still have your coffee. I mean, again, this just has so much functionality and it's not that it can't be put on performance yachts. Uh, MC has it on their 55. I've seen Max Cruise on their 48 have incorporated it. Um, there is a way to do this. It's just that the manufacturers have to dive in there. Look at the indirect lighting as we head into the saloon. I mean, this is a beautiful saloon. I mean, I felt terrible for the barefoot doctors when their 50 uh, went up in flames. But when I got onto this one, honestly, because I was on the 50 next door to it, I thought, I almost like this a little bit more. It's tiny little things like the countertops. So solid countertops are thick. They're like an inch and a half thick. They look solid. On the 50, they're thin and they have some metal in behind them. I, I really like tiny little details like that and it gave this such a sense of solidity and class. I really enjoyed it. Tons of storage. I'd probably put a, a wine cooler that faced towards the saloon at, the, at this end and take that up. Um, but you've got everything that you would possibly need. It did not feel cramped. It felt open and warm and inviting. Everything felt finished and polished really well, well done. Uh, again, you know, the front facing helm, I get it, but <clears throat> a stool is silly. It should have a, a, a chair with a back seat. Look at the indirect lighting. I really want to emphasize that because uh, the, the indirect lighting actually on the 50 next door was out and I did not appreciate how much ambiance that indirect lighting provides to that saloon until I saw it without it. So uh, believe me when I say that indirect lighting is absolutely outstanding. For the buck, you can't do much more to uh, make a, 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 a environment feel elegant. Looking down the stairs, you know I love looking at the stairs. Look at that polished uh, stainless on the tip of the stairs, love it. Uh, the TV here, which swivels out, beautiful position. Nice berth, airy, you've got um, beautiful hatches above, uh, opening hatches behind, uh, lots of light. Um, you've got uh, hatches even in the side ports. You can get up probably most of the way to easily make the head of the bed, which is all I really need. But you see the angles, the sharp angles here that I spoke of. You don't see this in the Aventura. Uh, I love what they're doing. I, they, they've gone with a warmer wood, although still it's a little bleached something or other. Um, I love the stainless steel uh, threshold moving into the bathroom. Uh, but the wood could use a little more warmth, a, a little more uh, feeling of realism to it. Uh, and those angles need to be softened. Uh, the bathroom here, really, really nice. Um, you got a single basin, great size shower. You've got a, uh, a makeup table there. Uh, let's head up now and into and across the saloon here. So overall, that owner's cabin is beautifully proportioned and really, really well done. I just wish that this thing weighed about three tons less. That would just be super. And I am quite sure the folks at Robertson and Kane can do it. Now look at the skylight there. As I said, that whole theme, these little design nuances, that theme of a black stripe all the way from the cockpit through the saloon and to the forward cockpit where it slides back and forth for that cover. It looks fantastic. I love those details. The carpet here feels great. You've got a great um, head here for your um, VIP uh, uh, berth in the back here uh, and again feels incredibly light and airy all the ventilation you'd want good storage a really comfortable place to spend time heading forward you've got another full-sized beautiful uh, head here again I think the barefoot doctors must be feeling pretty darn good about themselves because this is a beautiful beautiful yacht uh, as we move to the uh, slightly smaller uh, bow cabin, 
um, you can see they've still done an amazing job. Look at the windows, look at the hatches, look at the indirect lighting, look at the little details like the soft upholstery in the, in the shelf there to the right and the stainless steel bars across it. And then they've got access into the four peak um, that adds a little more sense of space if you want to leave it open. Great hatch and underfloor storage in this uh, vessel. I mean, you can really uh, outfit it uh, to, to do some serious crossings. Overall, you know, it, it just has such a terrific feeling. She just needs to go on a diet. And there's got to be a way to take about three ton off this thing and improve those numbers. Maybe you could get together with your Aussie friends at uh, Advanced Wing Systems and throw a wing sail on this. I think it'd be an ideal solution for what you're doing here. Uh, as we take another gander around uh, the uh, side decks here and head up onto this beautiful Sky Lounge. I mean, Leopard executes this Sky Lounge flawlessly. Nice table, uh, stay in place cushions, you don't have to worry about them. You don't have to take them in. They're not going to get saturated. Uh, that, that rigid uh, bimini over the helm, gosh, it just looks fantastic. And there's your, your sails. Now, little navel gazing. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, I'll tell you what we'll talk about. Let's talk about in sail solar panels or solar sails, solar material. This is a tremendous uh, innovation from a UK sail company. They've developed a nice, very thin uh, CIGS, uh, it's called copper, indinium, gallium, and selenium. Uh, and it's used to achieve a supple and thin support of 65 microns and 125 grams per square meter. It's, it's like a silk scarf. After encapsulation, the cells weigh 210 grams per square meter. With the so-called encapsulation technique used for the production of polyester webs, these photovoltaic films could be integrated into the fabric. It is also possible to make patches to fix on existing sails, which also allows them to be used at anchor when the sails are slumped. These CIGS cells have the advantage of capturing light in different directions, which is important for media that are not always ideally oriented relative to the sun, as is the case with a sail, and which also makes it possible to recover the light reflection on the surface of the water. <clears throat> With a yield of 12 to 14 percent, five square meters in 16 panels on each side of the sail lead to a power of one kilowatt. The 16 panels are installed on each side of the main sail. The cells are included in fibers with the same encapsulation technique as that of making the fabric of the sail itself. The 38 foot Akron Akrona uh, 380Z is a 100% en energy autonomous sailing yacht. It is the first boat manufactured in series to integrate a solar mainsail, the solar cloth system by UK sailmakers. The system prints ultra flexible photovoltaic cells directly onto the sails cloth, providing a cap capacity of one kilowatt. The sail, along with solar panels on the deck and rig, 800 kilowatts, are then connected with Ocean Volt's innovative electric motor system. So there you have it. Sailcloth with embedded solar cells. This is a technology that's used on the Black Pearl. And uh, actually, that's the first time I heard of it. So I hope you enjoy it. I think it's a tremendous solution, not only for an anchor, but, but for when you're sailing to add power to what you're doing. Moving back on board now as we scan around this beautiful elevated saloon or cockpit, um, we're going to head back down. Uh, there's your helm. And again, you feel so incredibly protected when you're in there. The solidity of that top's fantastic. 
Now looking, uh, I did my best to get you a side angle to get you some kind of a profile of this in situ. Wasn't terribly successful, but you can get a sense of, you know, the grab handles and uh, the safety elements that are there. There is a bit of a gap without uh, grab handles there, but you also have your uh, standing rigging that you could grab onto in between those. Um, and overall, she's a handsome yacht. I could get in my tender and drive away from this, look back, and be extremely proud of her, especially if my beloved is sitting up on that Sky Lounge sipping a cocktail and uh, maybe our friends are in the front cockpit enjoying themselves in the, in the light breeze while I head to shore to uh, replenish the gin and tonic. Moving on to our pre-owned comparables. Our first stop is the Antares 44GS, a 44-foot yacht from 2019. Now our Leopard 50 is a sail away. Remember, we add about 50% to the base to get there. Uh, looks to be about 1.1 million, so 1,085,000 sail away. We're looking at a, a three-year-old boat here for 925. Now, the Antares is an exceptionally beautiful yacht inside. I mean, wow, you, you cannot fault their design inside, their cabinetry. Everything is absolutely exquisite. The exterior, though, is dated. Antares, we need to get you a 50-foot uh, hull, uh, um, hull mold and get this sucker updated and apply your incredible capabilities to a, a modern design. So. Um, I probably uh, would go with the Leopard on this one. Moving then to the Lagoon 46 2019, again a three-year-old boat asking 775,000. Brand new Leopard, million eighty-five. I'm going to have other toys on the Lagoon. Uh, this would be a hard one. I I'd probably have to lean to the Lagoon for economic reasons. Uh, but it's hard to beat that front cockpit and uh, the, the, the fly lounge on the Leopard. Now, the, the Lagoon 46s, obviously the newer ones, do have something of a fly lounge. The uh, next one is a 2021 Leopard 45. So this is a one-year-old boat. They're asking 928,998 versus a million eighty-five. I'd immediately go with the pre-owned boat because it'll have toys that the owner fitted out on here included in that price. It, it's run in, it's perfect. Uh, now, I'm gonna do something a little different that may raise hackles. I'm gonna look at monohulls as a comparative as well. If you look at monohulls versus catamarans in sheer hull length, okay, but that's not the way we look at houses. We look at houses in square footage of usable space. And in square footage of usable space, or the general feel of space that you have, you gotta tack on 10 feet to do a decent comparable on a monohull. So I'm looking here at 55, 54 to 56 foot monohulls and comparing them to the Leopard 45. So our first stop is the iconic 2017 ML 55. Uh, love this vessel, love the quality of the interior. So we're looking at 980,942 versus a million one. Um, it is, okay, a four-year-old vessel. Be a bit of a toss-up. Uh, if it were just me, I'd probably go the ML because I just love their interiors. I love their fully integrated, fully automated sail system, sail handling systems. I think it's a brilliant yacht. I love their, their uh, protected cockpit. Um, but uh, I would probably, if it was, if it was uh, Sylvia uh, going with me, it would have to be the catamaran just because of the healing, unless I misjudge her. Moving then next to the Hansa 588, you've got 609-217. This boat has a lot of space. It has a hard top. Um, you know, it has equivalent space to the uh, Leopard 45. And so you're looking at 609 versus a million one uh, for a three-year-old boat uh, with all the toys added to it. That's a heck of a value. Again, if you're okay with the healing, 
uh, 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 this, 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 is a, this is an absolute fantastic value. Um, moving now to the DeFore, um, 2021, it's a 56. Uh, it is uh, $619,000, and it's one year old versus a million one. I'm proving my own self wrong here on what my uh, intro was. So there we go. I guess I learned from my own videos. Mono hulls are cheaper, even if you add on 10 to 15 feet. Oh well. Moving to the Dave score. Okay, so again, my Dave score does ruffle feathers because it is from Sylvia's perspective. And Sylvia looks at her house and then looks at a boat. She doesn't look at another boat and then look at a boat. So everything seems small to her and it's finding that floating condo that actually sails decently that's the challenge. So with the Leopard 45, you know, it comes in at uh, 71 points, uh, just behind the Aventura 37 and the Katana OC50, <clears throat> uh, actually tied with them, as well as the Du 448, and a point behind the Leopard 50. So uh, elegance, I'd give it a six. Um, we've talked about the, the wood grain and whatnot. It's, it's nowhere near an Antares. Uh, exterior, give it a seven. It really is well executed on the exterior. Uh, comfort, uh, interior, give it an eight. It re you know, very comfortable boat in the inside. Exterior, give it an eight. You've got front cockpit, cockpit, fly lounge, back cockpit. I mean, there's just nothing you don't have. Uh, quality, I give it an eight. It felt like a very strong boat. Um, I, I'm not thrilled with the balsa in the upper sections of the hull, but that's on Lagoon as well, so what can you say? Uh, performance, of course it's a six. It should probably be a five now that I'm a little more educated. Uh, lazy sailor, a seven. It's you know, fairly easy to sail, although from my uh, friends at um, Sailing La Vagabond, uh, their point was it's probably harder to sail because uh, you, you have to push it so hard, you have to work so hard to get this thing sailing. I never really thought about it from that perspective, but he's right. He pointed out ORC 57, you could sail it with three reefs all day long and still be making way. Uh, Geek score, six, there's nothing wild on this one. Value for money, um, I'm gonna give it an eight. <clears throat> I think it's, you know, for what it is, it's a great value. She needs to go on a diet, about three tons worth of diet, and you do wonders with her. Moving to our art of the region, and I do love the art of this region. It is not difficult to find a work out of South African artists that I absolutely love. And this week we're looking at uh, Isabelle Leroux. Uh, it's called uh, Terentel in Fanshoke. Now, the Afrikaner, I had a wine expert trying to, to show me how to pronounce the wine I had for the Leopard 50 or, 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 or one of them, and I couldn't wrap my tongue around it. So those of you from South Africa, do forgive my horrendous pronunciation of this particular area. So oil on canvas. Now, uh, Isabel Leroux was born in uh, Rustenburg, Northwest Province, South Africa. She is one of the most prolific artists in South Africa. Isabel has been painting professionally since 1974 and has held more than 50 solo exhibitions locally as well as overseas. Her works are included in the collections of numerous corporations and are sought after by art galleries, art dealers and private investors. Uh, Franz Schuluk is a town in South Africa's Western Cape with centuries old vineyards and Cape Dutch architecture. Uh, trails wind through flowers and wildlife at Mount Rochelle uh, Nature Reserve to views of Fran Sherlock Valley. Uh, Tarantel are the helmeted guinea fowl uh, and it's widely distributed throughout, the, throughout South Africa and was traditionally hunted for sport. People often marvel at these birds with their black gray bodies an unmistakable colorful head and feathered crown, featherless crown. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the tour this week. As you can tell, I love, I love the Leopard line. I love their innovations. I just wish they'd lose some weight. Other than that, I think they're a wonderful vessel built very sturdily. Obviously they have to, they were built almost exclusively for charter originally and 
they show it in their durability and the materials they use. I honestly think they need to warm things up and, and take another step towards uh, private ownership uh, applications of the vessel. So hope you've enjoyed it. The wine was great. The art, I love it. Have a great week and we'll see you back here next week. Cheers.